software developer at Arthrex. See if I can make this tiny up here. All right. So I'm a software developer three at Arthrex. I work in the medical visualization team. Uh, we uh, do a lot of really interesting things for marketing and uh, different products in the company. And I want to talk about testing interactions in XR. So interactions are really at the core of XR technologies. Um, and I feel like testing should be something that is at the forefront whenever you're building these kind of applications. So first of all, my work. Uh, so you can see here some of the things I've worked on. I've worked on the this Arthur Man application, which is a showcase, which is the one that you saw at the last that showcase event that was in the big screen. Um, Arthur Man is just a way for the company to show the products, the the, the, the different devices that they're selling, uh, in this interactive application that kind of a, it makes an exploratory pathway into learning more about the products. It shows you different animations, different videos of how to use the products, and it shows a 3D model and it's all interactive. It's a full desktop application. And soon will be also a mobile application. Another thing we work on is on AR, VR, and those are actual products. So I don't have as many pretty pictures to show about that because their internal products are still in development. They're very early and they're cutting edge. So a lot of the technology is still kind of uh, undercover. But um, another thing that we have is we have a virtual production um, team and studio, and we um, use innovative technologies from the virtual production world, from the film industry, uh, along with this giant video wall to create uh, pretty much bring any environment like the operating room of the future into this virtual wall. And so we can film uh, or doctors or um, whoever comes by and wants to sell one of the products uh, with the giant wall behind it, showing the actual products and the, and the OR. So uh, more of my background, I also worked in this Fire 360 application at FIU, right before I joined Arthrex. Um, I created a firefighter training simulation uh, that is now used by firefighters in the Miami-Dade County and the city of Miami and the city of Hialeah. Um, I graduated from FIU, so I'm very proud of this work. Um, you can see me there in the picture with the firefighters. So the idea here was that firefighters, uh, a lot of them um, die because of tactical uh, decision failures where the communication is key. And so we created this application where we simulate a, re a response to an emergency um, and they have to kind of communicate with each other. And the focus was uh, how do we use the visuals in this virtual environment to give them, to overwhelm them with everything that's happening kind of like it would be in the real situation seeing the fire and, and you know having different people uh down and they have to pick them up and take them back to the truck so it it was really um interesting how the firefighters were actually under pressure as they were using the the simulation um it's really exciting to see that um let me see next so XR interactions. So there's many different types of interactions that we have today, thanks to AR technologies and VR technologies. We have the controllers, which were the first way we interacted um, in VR with objects. It's you, uh, their Oculus Touch were like the one of the first ones that made a massive difference because there was the Vive ones, but they were like kind of clunky. But then we got the touch controllers from the Oculus. And now people were like grabbing things and using their hands the way you would naturally grab objects. And Oculus did an amazing job to make those controllers feel like you were really grabbing something. Uh, but we've come a long way. And now there's AR devices like the HoloLens where you have interactions with your hands using hand tracking, 
um, and other technologies. Now even Oculus, the latest Oculus Quest headset has it as well. So there's like air tap sort of interactions where you, you're clicking buttons and uh, not clicking, touching buttons and uh, grabbing items and scaling them. Um, and all of that is just happening in the air with your hands using hand tracking, right? There's also gaze. So the, some of these AR headsets like the HoloLens and other headsets can, can see, uh, can follow your eyes and track them and see where you're looking at. You want me to use the microphone? Uh, okay. So the gaze is very important to kind of tell where the user is looking at and, and get information of what's really appealing to the person using the device. And then there's body, full body tracking inputs where you have legs, arms, and everything. Your whole body is immersed. Um, and there's a combination of all of these together as well for like the perfect immersion. There's also voice interactions so you can talk and, and these have been around for longer than VR has been around. But with all the other types of interactions, when they all come together, it really makes a massive difference because you really feel immersed, like you're part of this world and it's, this world is not independent from you. You're, it's all integrated. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. All right. Yeah. So here are some of the tools. Um, if you guys are ever interested in developing um anything in vr ar these are like the biggest tools right now um there's mitk which is built by microsoft it's an open source framework uh, it's kind of like the angular of ar vr it's a, a ui framework uh gives you different buttons and different um, components that you can interact with and they're all ready to go it's kind of a drag and drop uh, process but you have access to the full code as um, the original code was in Unity. It was all in C Sharp, but there's a lot of backend that's in C++ as well. Um, they have the MRTK in Unreal as well now. Um, I believe it's called XR Tools. Um, Oculus has their presence platform, and that's that's with the uh, Oculus Rift or the Oculus Quest. Uh, they released it specifically for the Oculus Quest because the Oculus Quest now has hand tracking, and they haven't supported hand tracking on the Rift yet. But the present platform is brand new and it does the same thing as the MITK. It provides a set of components and interactions with your hands that, um, that you can use in your applications. So you don't have to build all these interactions from the ground up. You can get any of these libraries and you can start bringing those components into your projects and um, building applications with them. There's also the OpenXR initiative uh, where they created this standard uh, for in inputs uh, for all XR sort of devices, type of devices, and all the major um, engines have adopted it and even some other third-party SDKs have also adopted them. And the idea there is that you build for one set of inputs, which are the OpenXR inputs, and it doesn't matter what device, your application is running on. If it supports OpenXR, your inputs and your applications that you built will work. There's also UltraLeap, which they're doing some uh, hand tracking. They're really, they've been doing that for a while. There's the Luminance Decay from Magic Leap, which is in the other coast. Um, and they're doing AR as well. They have AR glasses. Uh, VR expansion is a VR specific set of tools uh, and interactions for Unreal Engine. And then there's Steam VR, which is one of the most popular ones, uh, which I think is mostly supported in Unity in terms of the SDK part of it. But it's also, it could be used in Unreal. It's just a lot of the work you'd have to do yourself. And then there's the BRTK for Unity, which is comprehensive solution of VR interactions as well and different forms of locomotion and movement. So I want to talk about my, my process and my, my experience of what I worked on. Um, it's been mostly prototypes and demos in order to get either investment or get buy-in into a product. And that's kind of what I'm doing in Arthrex as well right now. Um, the 
even when I was developing the firefighter simulation, we were developing a full product, but every step of the way, we were trying to sell uh, what, what was the next big thing for the firefighter training simulation. And it's no different here at Arthrex. Every step of the way, we're building these tools, but there's a big emphasis when it comes to innovative technologies that are just groundbreaking. They're like cutting edge that you have to continuously show uh, what, you know, what's the next big milestone that you can accomplish with the technology because things are coming out every day. So you were using a system today and then a week later, a massive company like Meta, Facebook or Microsoft releases a whole framework like MRTK and now you kind of have to switch and show, you know, the value behind using that framework because a lot of features are opened up for your application that you didn't have before. So. The good thing about this prototyping demo mentality uh, and development is that it's achievable for small teams. My team at Arctics is around four people. Um, so it works great for us. Um, it's great for innovation. You're always going to be uh, showing the best that's out there because you're building these prototypes and this demos of the latest and greatest. Um, it's great for research because you're learning how new technologies are going to be adopted before they're actually uh, widespread and being used by, every, by everyone. And it allows for continuous growth. You're always being at the cutting edge it means you're always going to be growing into new projects. And that's been the case in my experience at Artex. And then frequent updates, super important. There will always be something new to show because you're preparing for a demo or because you have a new prototype. They're smaller in scale. You, you wouldn't take as long as when you're building a full-fledged application. Um, so there will always be something new to show. The bad is that, of course, when you're building prototypes and you're trying to run demos and you're trying to do this on a frequent manner, you have no dedicated QA team. So four people, really all four people are focused on the actual development of the application. So nobody really has a lot of time to do QA and QA is usually done like once a week or something like that. It's not, we don't have a dedicated QA person. And I know that a lot of indie developers or people who are trying to build their own apps run into the same problem. They don't have a team of QA that is gonna take their app and kind of um, test it for every edge case. Uh, so yeah, no time for sufficient QA. Uh, less time for user testing because you're trying to do a demo, so you're not going to have a lot of time to show other people before you show it to the, your target audience. In fact, when you do show it to your target audience, it's because you want to get some feedback for your application. And there's uh, many iterations. Your demos mean it has to be working every time you showcase it, so you're going to have to have a lot of versions. So version management is definitely going to be your friend. Um, there's going to be less time for review because you're not never taking this. So in, in your average software development cycle, you'd have a, a long period of time where you're just pushing updates and, and doing developing all these things, but you're not releasing anything because you're preparing for release. Um, in this case, your demos are your release. So you'd be constantly releasing a product that has to work when you demo it. Um, so there's also less time for documentation and less time for onboarding developers um, because you got to get it done. Uh, and the goal is also constantly changing because whenever you do a demo, you get a, a lot of feedback and now people want to add new things. And it just, it, it goes back to a continuous growth where it's always growing and becoming a, a bigger product as people discover all the possibilities that the technology has. So then what's the solution? Solution is automated testing. Now, automated testing is used for development, software development everywhere. But when it comes to prototypes and demoing in a small team, you think that the amount of time that it consumes would be a problem, but it's actually an advantage to have automated testing from the get-go. It reduces the amount of iterations. It removes the experience uh, user bias. So one of the biggest problems with VR is that when you are creating VR applications, you're showing it to people who maybe have never tried VR. So you're going to, there's a lot of information, a lot of things that they're learning all at once. 
and they interact with it kind of the, the way their brain is already wired to deal with what they're seeing. Um, so to get that and replicate that uh, every time you do a demo or before you do a demo as you're testing, it's really difficult um, because you wouldn't have to get somebody who's seen it for the first time. And usually the developers are not people who've seen it for the first time, they've seen the application a lot of times. But it's really unique with VR because you're experiencing this whole new world for the first time and your mind is going like crazy. It's a lot of, um, it's a lot to deal with it's seeing this virtual reality or even on, on XR, on AR, seeing this 3D model, how do you, you know, what are the interactions? You start thinking of so many things that the traditional application where people are used to clicking on buttons and uh, sliders and opening windows, they're already familiar with those concepts. Even if it's a new app, they're just trying to understand what this app does that other apps don't do, but they understand the concept of an app, be it a phone app or a web app or anything. They're not new to that concept. Um, so with VR, they are new. So the experience user bias is pretty, uh, it's important to remove it. Um, so we can replicate first time user behavior. Uh, we can reuse a lot of the systems um, through automated testing. We can have working examples because the test is an example um, by itself. And we can have better collaboration because new developers that are coming in have examples that they can look at by looking at the tests. Um, and in general, going, just testing in general increases confidence because you know that you're, the code that you've worked on, um, the things that you've developed are uh, tested. So they're proven to work. So what are the downsides of testing? Time, obviously, the amount of time that it takes to write a test, uh, to find uh, different tools to test uh, your applications with. Um, that's really the biggest downside. So in this talk, I'm just going to focus on Unity and on Rio because it's usually what uh, VR and AR and XR developers are familiar with. Uh, Unity, uh, it's C sharp base. It's a game engine. It's like any other SDK. Um, it allows you to build graphic applications, uh, specifically made for video games, but can be, really be used for any type of applications. It's being used at Arthrex to develop a lot of the applications that I just talked about. Um, Unity uses MITK uh, for AR, and I will be focusing on MITK and um, how do you test for MITK, and how to set that up. And uh, I will talk about behavior and interaction tests. So if we, you want to develop an application, you have a, your UI. The first thing you want to know is that when somebody press a button, the button will work. So let's say you have an application that, uh, I don't know, the play, displays uh, in a showroom, it displays a, 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 a machine you've built and you want to change the color and try different colors on the machine. Um, you would have a, a buttons come up and you just press one of the buttons to change the color. You want to make sure that that works. So it's no different than your regular uh, desktop application, but now because it's VR it's spatial, people can press the button from the side, they can press the button from the back. They don't really know, you know, what's the front and what's the back because you're not looking at your flat screen. You're, it's in 3D space, so you can walk around it. You can really, when you put the headset on, they can they might be looking at it from any perspective so it's really a testing challenge in that sense so we have interaction sort of testing that make tests for those type of interactions and we have the typical unit testing that you have in all your applications um uh, when you're developing applications for desktop or for web or for any other platform and then in unreal i'll focus on openxr and the openxr integration uh, both Unity and Unreal have OpenXR, uh, so you can develop an app um, in either one of these using those bindings, and it will work on any uh, headset that support that supports OpenXR. Um, I believe most VR headsets support OpenXR. I am not sure about AR headsets, which AR headsets support the OpenXR uh, standard but I know the HoloLens has 
the HoloLens MITK um, set of tools support the OpenXR standard. Uh, and these are just input bindings. Uh, they're just, they take the interaction that you're doing through the controller or through your tracking of the, the, the ones that you're using. Um, and they put it in a format that all these engines can understand and integrate on their own. And we'll be, test we'll be going over the same sort of concepts for those two. All right, so testing AR interactions with MITK. So MITK, again, it's a UI component framework for AR specifically that lets you build uh, AR uh, UI and different components for your applications. Um, now this has, uh, Unity has unit tests, play mode tests, and other sort of systems that you can build. And to be able to, to be able to uh, test your interactions. Now the unit test part of it is really for anything you're developing in Unity, but the play mode test is where it gets interesting because play mode tests allow you to actually go through the process of, of running the interaction, how it would look in the engine um, and get a result from it. So one of the things that, I, that I've learned from my past experience is that if you separate the way the interactions work from the input, you'd be able to reuse that in any sort of, uh, with any uh, framework that you find. So whether it's MITK or it's the one from Magic Leap, the Looming SDK, as long as your components and all these uh, items that you're building in AR and in VR are independent of the input system that you're utilizing, you can always change it, change your input system to be anything. If it's OpenXR, then you can focus on just OpenXR, but let's say you wanna switch between OpenXR and the Oculus uh, input system, which they have their own specific input system that works with the Oculus controllers. Um, if you build those two systems independent of each other, you will never have to worry about whether you're using the right input system where you have it referenced correctly or not. Now, a, a unit test looks kind of like this in Unity. They have a play mode tab where they have the name of your test. They have a check mark for whether the test is passing or not. Um, and it's red, it turns red if it doesn't pass. And this is an example test. It's not different than any other C-sharp uh, testing uh, library, it's just basic C-sharp. Um, so you have a class where you have your, your method, that's your test, and it asserts if it's equal or not. And then you have your test uh, attribute that defines it as a test. Um, so Unity does an amazing job of showing you all your tests like in any traditional uh, IDE, like Visual Studio or Writer, um, other developer IDEs. And, and you can add them straight from the interface. And whenever you are, you wanna like test your entire application, you can run all your, all your tests from the parent object and it will run everything under the hierarchy. You can also, pre-program it to run it before build. So if you're building your application, it could run through all your tests or you can deploy those tests to the device. So whenever you built your application and you just want to test it on the device, you don't have to like deploy the application, wait for it to build and all those things and then put the headset on and try it. You can just remotely deploy all your, your tests to the application. And uh, yeah, this is the, the basic C-sharp layout for that. All right, but the fun ones are the play mode tests. Uh, the play mode tests are the actual the, the ones that load the the Unity scene and they load all the models and you can interact with the models and all those things. Um, and what you'd be doing is you pretty much code what those interactions will look like. So instead of you putting the headset on and going and tapping on the button, you would just pre-program the uh, hand interaction to come up and move a certain distance towards the button and then that triggers the button and then you're just pretty much testing whether that actually triggered the button or not 
Um, and this is just an example of one of what one of those tests will look like. And the key here is the waiting for seconds. Uh, you can, in Unity, you have uh, these geo methods that allow you to wait um, for the um, for the update loop to get to um, for the amount that is that is, um, that is given. So in this case, it's a 0.1 second. Uh, it's given a float. So you're you this lets you wait for that amount before the next uh, code line gets executed. So if I put in here 60 seconds, I'll be waiting for 60 seconds. So the idea is that I would set my hand, for example, to move forward, and then I would wait for like 10 seconds, and I know that the hand should have hit the button within 10 seconds. And then I check after those 10 seconds if it did hit the button and if the button did the action it was supposed to do. And then Unity has set up and tiered down, which are uh, also part of uh, unit tests. They, they allow you to prepare your scene, load the scene, uh, load the hand interaction, load the buttons, and then run your code. And then you have a tier down where you can just unload your scene uh, so you can move on to the next test. Now, the interesting part when it comes to uh, VR and XR uh, in general uh, for testing is that, well, you have to put the headset on and do the interaction. Otherwise, how else would you be able to do the, those interactions, especially when they're really complicated, like their gestures? So, for example, think of uh, um, when you're painting in space and, and in 3D, there's an application called Tilt Brush where they let you paint in, in virtual space. And in that application, you want to test that the person was able to draw the whole time that it was drawing and that it was the shape of that the hand followed when the person was drawing, how would you go about doing that? You have to put the headset on, actually draw it, and then see if it worked or not. So to avoid that, uh, MITK has a system that is really great that lets you input, um, save an animation file from your interaction. So you do it once, do your uh, the drawing once, for example, in this example, you draw what you need to draw once, save that animation and then you'd be able to modify your code or modify your application and run that again and it, it's just saved all you have to do is call that animation every time you have a test that tests for that um, specific uh, feature and that gesture movement so and you can do this with anything you can do this with pressing a button you can do this with grabbing a window a virtual window and moving it around um, really there's no limitation to it uh, and ideally you'd record this in little parts so that your uh, window movement is one thing you record and uh, um, pressing of the button is another thing you record and you start building this little library of different animations that you've done um, in the, when you're interacting in XR and AR. And this creates a reusable library of animations uh, it allows you to create tutorials as well. Since you already have the animation, you can replay that back to a user and they can see exactly what button they have to press when they get in, in AR, VR. And you can even utilize this on a, on a real model, uh, especially with MYTK and MR. I use this in Arthrex too. We had a machine where we had a certain set of instructions that you had to follow in the machine. And we wanted to make sure that the person could go from like the first step to the last step and like follow all the instructions. And so what we did is we recorded what those interactions are for each step just by one of the members. And whenever we changed anything in the application, we just reran that interaction from one of the team members uh, on all the changes that we made. And we were able to test that it was working without having to go back and put the headset on every single time with the real uh, machine, which we didn't have available when we were developing. So it's really useful to record and save this library of animations uh, of the different gestures that you do when you're in VR. And, and, and it's interesting as well, because when you're doing a demo, you are able to record what people are doing within that demo. So if you're getting someone in for the first time, 
you would be able to record all the interactions that they did and then play it back in the in the engine when you're doing your testing. So you'd be able to reuse those same interactions and see, well, what if I change the UI, but I want the person to do the same type of interactions? Will it still work the same way? It will still behave the same way? So you can do those kind of changes when you record this interaction. So this is really powerful when it comes to VR. And it's really like one of the main uh, things that you need to keep in mind when you're uh, developing uh, XR applications, that you can do this. You can, the, the movements that you made can be tracked and therefore you can create animations of them. Another thing is testing in real environments. So the HoloLens headset and, and the, this, the Oculus Quest, any headset that uses either LiDAR or camera-based tracking, uh, it's constantly creating a 3D model of the room in order to map its spatial location. Um, and you can see it here, this is the one for the HoloLens. So the HoloLens has this amazing thing that uh, in the device portal, in the Windows device portal, that lets you load up this model and uh, see it in, 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 your, in your computer, in the device portal from someone who actually put the headset on and walked around. So you can record the model that was generated uh, from that room space. So it's pretty much an environment that's generated and they call them the, the files or room files. So the HoloLens creates something like this where it just kind of creates a mesh that covers all of the real objects to map where everything's located in space. And you can kind of see it here uh, in wireframe. Um, and you can take these models, you can load them into your engine and then you can put your animations that you've recorded and put it all together. And now you have everything the person did with the headset in a virtual in your in your development environment and you can test all the interactions that they did at a demo or a presentation from your development environment without having to go back give them the headset and try it on again and like okay try the same thing and let's see if you like it this way better you don't have to do it you can just load the environment load the animations and you have the same exact setup that they had when they were when you were doing the presentation. Okay. So that was MITK in Unity, um, but there's also uh, OpenXR in Unreal that's more specific and oriented towards VR. Um, it's also built into the engine. Uh, this one's built into the engine. I mean, and it uses the input system and has screenshot comparison, which I'll talk about, which is very interested. Um, and there's some limited unit testing. It's not as advanced as uh, Unity's solution. So Unreal testing gives you this window where it shows all the different tests that you can use in your, uh, when you're developing these levels. And you can barely see it, but well, Here's what the code would look like if you guys are interested in the code. Um, this is your basic unit test. Um, and these are very useful when you're developing an application, but really what makes a bigger difference when you're working with XR and AR is those play mode tests for the same reasons that I was just mentioning where you can record the animation and replay it back. Uh, when you're doing a unit test, it's your standard, you know, test if your method actually works or not. And then the also in Unreal, the when using mocking frameworks, which allow you to mock how a system works, if you don't don't want to load the entire system from the engine in order to do a test, because it would make the test very long. Um, Unreal doesn't really have a good solution for that. You kind of have to get an external mocking framework like Google Mock. And so it's it's kind of difficult to do unit testing in Unreal because of that, but it's still possible. That's why I wanted to show it here. But then there's the real-time testing, which uses the same window. But in this case, it loads up uh, a level and runs through uh, all the different interactions that you set up in that level. Um, so also Unreal has visual scripting. So they allow you to kind of connect this um, there's different nodes uh, together and 
do the same sort of interactions and the same setup that you would do in C Sharp in Unity. And in Unity has a similar system, but I'm not sure that it's integrating with their testing solution. Um, but this, so once you set up your test in, in, in Unreal, you can visualize the entire flow of the test from beginning to end with the with your blueprint, and then you can run it from your um, from this the the test runner in in Unreal, and you it will load up the scene, and you you can if you speed it up, it will do it really fast, but you can slow it down so you can kind of see what's happening, and it will load up your scene. It will run through the animation that you've recorded, same way in Unity, and it will do the interaction, and you'd see the result, and this will show either a green bar or a red bar, if it passed or not. Now, this is the interesting one here, the screenshot comparison. So Unreal has this tool that lets you compare two screenshots from uh, the camera or wherever you place that camera in the virtual scene uh, and kind of see the difference. And it shows you right here, you can see the the two, the, the, the expected truth and the, the incoming file that it saw. That I found, and then the difference in the middle. And what that's very useful for is because, unlike uh, your regular screen in VR, you have different perspectives. And sometimes you want to model, um, let's say you have a UI and it's supposed to be facing you uh, all the time. And there's many things like this, like HUDs and things like that in AR and VR, where you want it to be constantly facing the user and you want to test that that actually works. You can look at the at that HUD or that um, interface from different perspectives. And using this system, you can test if it looks the same, no matter what the perspective of the user's heads is. So this is actually really useful to make sure there's consistency when you're moving through a virtual world and that you're always seeing the same kind of interfaces. Um, it's really interesting because it's not intended for that. It's built for a different reason, but it, it's really useful uh, in, in VR and XR to be able to compare that the user is seeing the same image from different perspectives. Is it kind of like tracking? Like, like if you're like a person, a virtual person is talking to you, no matter where you turn, that person will always have to see all the Yeah, so exactly. It's like the, usually it's called the billboard effect where it's always facing you, no matter where you look at. Like yeah, exactly. It, with those type of effects, if what usually happens is that that doesn't really work that way in 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 VR or in um, XR and AR because you're moving around. So at one point something is occluding and something is in front of you and it stops doing the billboarding or the billboarding is still working but you can't see it anymore so it's not really rendered. Um, and this will help you find that because it can compare those two images from different perspectives. They will take an image from this perspective and then from this perspective and I can see, okay, are they different? Also works the other way. If I wanna know that when you change perspective, you're looking at a different uh, uh, object or you're looking at a different image, it will also tell you that. So it, it's really useful. Uh, and then again, they have, you Unreal doesn't really have a recording system like the MITK already comes with, but you can build your own. Um, and it's really useful to do so. I've done that myself and it's, it's really great because I'm able to record all the interactions that I do in XR, um, whether it's with the controllers, whether it's eye tracking, eye gaze, um, and replay them back and see how the, the system I've built behaves with the same set of interactions whenever I change that system um, and add something new to it. Uh, yeah, you want to create a reusable library for recording all these interactions and record uh, record uh, while you're doing a demo because then that way you have the actual target audience uh, experience with the interface and you can replay that back when you're doing development and see you know how you can change the, the application you built to match to create a better experience for your user. And then another one is boundary, test, boundary testing. Boundary testing uh, in VR, you have room scale, 
and room scale means you can walk everywhere, you still should be able to see your model. So if I place the model here and I walk over there, I should be able to still see my model there. But tracking is not perfect all the time, especially when I'm not looking at the, at the location of the model. Uh, for example, with the Oculus Quest, if I just walk that way, sometimes the tracking will not work. And then when I look back, the model is no longer in the place where it's supposed to be. But boundaries are great for testing this. I ran into this problem while I was developing a lot of times because we were uh, walking around an area. And when you went back to the place, the digital content will no longer be overlaid on top of the real objects that you wanted it to be overlaid on. And it's a problem mostly in when it comes to AR, but it's also in VR as well, because uh, if you are in a physical space and you're walking through that physical space and that's the experience is walking through that physical space, you wanna make sure that it's mapped to the physical space. There's many ways to solve it, but one of the really good ones is creating this uh, boundary testing solutions where you make sure that the boundary kind of always stays around the same area and it's the, the reach that you have when you walk is always the same, that the objects don't go outside the boundary uh, that you're interacting with. So if you're interacting with an object and you keep walking uh, with the object in your hand and then you move back and you let go of the object, you wanna make sure that that object is not, doesn't go outside of the boundary to a place where you can't really reach it because you wanna have all the, if it's UI, you wanna have the UI uh, in a place where you can reach and you can tap on your buttons. Uh, definitely use the existing room scale boundary systems. The, the Quest has room scale boundary system that you can access through the API from Unity and from Unreal. Um, you can use that system in order to set the boundaries for your uh, VR application as well. So you don't have to build your own. It's pretty much there for you. So it's really useful to just kind of take advantage of it. And also if you have an object that you're supposed to grab, but it, it it's supposed to be attached to another object like through a string or, or maybe because it relates in some way to a, to a, one of the objects, maybe it has a wire and you know that your wire has a limit to how far it can go, then definitely test for that. This, the boundary testing works for that too. You can set a boundary between the max length of the wire and, the, and your object that is attached to the wire. And with that boundary, if it goes outside the boundary, your test fails. And that way you know that, okay, something's wrong because my object's not supposed to go past that length that I gave it. And also for hand reach, um, if you're interacting with UI, it, the same problem comes up where if the UI window is too far, you kind of have to walk to it. You want to have these boundary tests to make sure that the UI is at arm length, arm length distance and that you're always able to reach and click on, on the things you have to click on, or touch the things you have to touch. Um, So the importance of testing interactions, uh, reduce iteration, prepares for edge cases, um, facilitates building demos because you have those uh, recordings of your other demos. Uh, it gives you confidence when delivering updates because you've tested your application with all the different interactions that people did during their demos and the different use scenarios and encourages reusability of this animation that you've created in different tests. Uh, this, some areas for further research is uh, mapping animations to key inputs. So you create a traditional serve application where you just press a key and it does the animation. Um, another one is the Lumin SDK for the Magic Leap has this integrated into the SDK. So maybe the engines can explore integrating it into the engine. That would be really helpful. Um, and there's some research papers on like ways that you can improve uh, testing uh, in VR using the same sort of systems and the same sort of tools. And then you guys have any questions? Yeah. Of the application, mm -hmm. the testing, uh, for, uh, 
Same way, every time they come in, they light up the same way that way. The dean or the acute patient goes exactly where it needs to go. Yeah, so the patient could be tracked. Right. Um, if we have some. But I'm not saying that's more of a practical complication, but yeah. maybe not in the scope of the testing. But, yeah. but, but not, I know it's not intended for that, but it could be. Absolutely. To use, if you have a scan, when the pass it, making sure that people don't find out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If, if you have like if you have recorded where the person is using some sort of tracking yeah. and you have the scan of the patient, you can yeah, you can compare. I mean, usually do that with like a CT scan or like yeah. Or yeah, but no, that totally works. You can compare the scan of yeah. so where it's supposed to be. Our first yeah. so we got a difference. Yeah. Yeah. Did you say that the one to take comes with some tools like uh, the UI? Yeah. It has like all set up already, or you have to like make sure it's already set up for you. What's that? It's already set up. Oh. You don't have to. And that and that that only for Hololens, right? Yeah. So MIT is only for Hololens. Some of the components you can use in VR as well, but you have to do yeah, right. a no, lot but of work. Talk about like if I want to develop like you know. Apple one things. So MRTK is supported in like the Unity engine, so you should be able to use the same components yeah. for developing applications for other devices, so as long as you have the device specific. The, um, uh, yeah, Core, yeah, Kit, yeah. it's all apart, like it's on top, works on top of it. <laughs> so it would be separate. Oh. This is this is just a component-based system. It's for Unity to work with Unity. They have things that are specific to the whole one. But the UI component aspect of it okay. doesn't necessarily have to be specific to the whole so, amount. So if I want to develop for my phone, yeah. I, I can do that and then I'll have kind of basic framework, it's kind of like not like you need hand tracking, so it wouldn't no, that, well, most that, of it, will, that will be a part of oh yeah. Right, right. So I'm that trying to think support, how support yeah. This so the MITK is mostly yeah. for hand tracking, hand yeah. style interactions. Yeah, and there's case interactions as well, but I don't know, in your phone, you wouldn't have anyway. So it, it would be more useful with the uh, Oculus, for example, and that there's people who've used MITK on the Oculus Quest. Really? Yeah, yeah, because they have pass-through in the Oculus Quest, yes, yes. but even without pass-through, they have um, hand tracking in the Oculus Quest. So uh, you can use the same sort of UI components for building uh, your, an application in VR, uh, and those are your buttons and your, everything and I, I want to show a little more because I know I mean I wasn't sure what the so are you guys familiar with MITK because I I can show a video about it so this is what MITK pretty much is you see it it's the the components those call out components uh those interaction uh tools that track your hands yeah so the actual um the core kit they don't allow like hand interaction to what they already have like can they scale like, i think they can you can but i'm not i haven't worked with air core as much but I think it's through your phone though. You have those interactions in your phone, but I don't know that you have like hand tracking like that. Like you film your hand doing things. These are more oriented towards like headsets because you have those cameras constantly yeah. looking at your hands while on your phone, you'd have to put your hand in front of your camera. Yeah. You got the iPhone, you got the iPhone, the I don't think you do. Yeah, I had that. I had that talk. 
Yeah, this is mostly what we're using in an RTX for HoloLens development because this is what Microsoft created as the, it's really the biggest framework because it's open source. So there's a lot of people contributing to it. Um, and it's just a full AR framework. But then Oculus has the Oculus Presence platform that they just released. It does the same thing for the Oculus Quest. Yeah, oh, internet is a little slow. Is the Oculus Interaction SDK? It's what it's called, but it's part of their presence platform that includes voice, uh, even eye tracking at some point, um, because they will be releasing other headsets, and I think their next headset is going to be a pass-through headset. So it will have a lot of those AR um, interactions. Let's see if I can show a video of that. Okay, might be here. Yeah, so for example, this is an example of it, the piano example. Where he's pressing the the keys as they come, it's because it's hand tracking, and it's AR as well. But really, that that's gonna have a lot of use. Yeah. Yeah, it's the same concept over piano. And then this person here is like kind of setting their the real house boundaries pretty much. They're capturing it. So it's the same thing that the MRTK does where you can capture your room bring it as a 3D model into your um, application and use it for testing or anything. Oh, they don't really show as much there. But it's that the whole concept of seeing understanding in well, generating so these really models. Like yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so he's just drawing it, but um, it could generate it as well because it's it's kind of tracking all that. But the RTX application that you guys are working on, uh, it's it's actually in use right now by uh, medical professionals. So um, it, everything, still everything that we're working on as a product is still in development. So VR and AR, especially in the medical industry, yeah. is a thing that takes time mm -hmm. to adapt. So they don't have any products out there yet. Um, and I don't think anyone has any products out no, there. No, no, I understand that the, the demo that I saw was very, very complete. It had, yeah. had all the prototypes. Yeah, that's so, the one I worked on. Yeah. Really uh -huh. uh, so I was wondering if it was actually being used anywhere. Yeah, so it's actual. being used for trials, but for not trials. for actual surgeries yet. No, no, of yeah. course. <laughs> for, yeah, that's what I meant. It's yeah, yeah, it's it actually, is. What it is. Being shown to, to yeah, surgeons are coming by exactly. and they're they're looking at them and they're yeah. giving us feedback constantly. Uh -huh. That's part of the reason why this is so important to me because I get feedback all the time and I constantly change the application. Mm -hmm. So it's super important to me to be able to record that. Like, so uh, we use so because we have artists, medical visualization theme, we have a lot of artists, we have to use plastic. But it's kind of like this. Very similar to this. It's Unity's uh, provided um, version management, but it works very similar to this. This is like an analog. So yeah. Again. So you mentioned it's all 
This is like what it just did. And I'm trying to explain. Yeah, and, and it's constantly changing because regulation change and scope changes. It's crazy. Oh yeah, like new requirements for yeah new ideas for the future mm -hmm. to try to do that. Absolutely, yeah. It's it's a iterative process where we're constantly getting feedback. You know, creating a new demo, demo in that, and then get more feedback, and then creating a new one, and so on. But yeah, the applications we built are ready for prime time. It's just that it takes a long time to run to get um, to that point where they want to use them and the uh, go on. They don't think they saw the report. That's okay. Oh, whoops. They didn't, they didn't share the screen. It's okay. Any other questions? Oops. Uh, I have a question. Anybody here never tried VR? I mean, you never tried oh, that? Do you want do you wanna um can we set up casting through your thing, through your device? I think so. I'm, I'm not we can, sure. We can put it up on here on the screen. Uh, I think I'm going to wrap up online and then we can come down here and we can try. All right. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. We're going to. All right. Hold on. Let me see if there is any questions in the chat. Uh, Tina was excited about your presentation. Great. Awesome. Great presentation, mindset. Uh, do you guys have any questions online? Oh, uh, I have a question. Yes. So I have a Windows Mixed Reality headset. It's not a HoloLens 2. It's HP Reverb G2. Nice. And yes. uh, that um, I tried to add the MRTK, but since there's a lot of uh, errors and I wonder if that conflict with the other XR interaction toolkit or something that's already, um, or maybe when I try to select the, the headset, it wasn't doing it yeah. right, I think. Yeah, so the, well, for the people here, the question was about MITK and using it with uh, mix Windows Mixed Reality headsets. So Windows Mixed Reality headsets, can you hear me by the way? Yes, I can. Okay. Windows Mixed Reality headsets are VR headsets and MRTK is built mostly for AR. So it does take some work to extract uh, some of the components from the MRTK to make it work for VR. So it wouldn't be straightforward where you just um, add the MRTK and it will work. You have to strip out the, the components from it, oh, but it, okay. it's, yeah, it's not straight. <laughs> yeah. So uh, if I tried it again, and if uh, I can contact you for any specifics. Yeah, I would love I to give more. you more details on that. Um, okay. I would say uh, the, the interaction SDK, and I'm sorry, you guys couldn't see it. Uh, I was trying to pull it up here, but the interaction SDK is probably the way to go. Uh, for your need uh, because it does a lot of the same things and it's already I think it's already out it's available already for developers you mean the XR interaction toolkits right uh, well Oculus just released an interaction oh, SDK okay. uh, it was just released like a few weeks ago okay um, I think this is it and that interaction SDK has the same type of interactions and that one you can use in VR and it will be ready to go. Um, and if you're using something like Unity, uh, it's very easy to integrate. You have to, yeah, this one's sharing, this one's sharing. Yeah, it's definitely sharing. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so yeah, this one, it's, it has the same sort of interactions from MRTK, but it's already ready to go with VR. You just have to install the Oculus tools, but just because it's Oculus doesn't mean it doesn't work with other headsets. Okay. It, the same sort of interactions will work with other headsets. Now, the problem is that these are hand-tracked 
uh, interactions, most of them. And the HP reverb doesn't have hand tracking unless you add a, a ultra leap a mo uh, or motion leap. Uh, I don't remember the name of it module that gives you hand tracking. So, but the interactions that they have built, you can still reuse an OVR, which is their, their SDK and it's in the Unity Asset Store. Uh, already comes with a lot of these interactions for controllers. Yes. I think but if I you want hand interactions, before. yeah, go ahead. Um, no, <laughs> please continue. Yeah, so if you want hand interactions like these, you're going to have to get a, a, something to do hand tracking. Oh. Um, yeah, but if you want to do something with controllers, then your best bet is oh. going with uh, OVRs, SDK for Unity hmm. or the VRTK, like I showed in my slide. So I'll just give you a preview. So, so if you're in, oh, okay, that's going to change. So you see VRTK, that's a good one. You can use the Steam VR SDK, but those don't have hand interactions, of course. Those are for controller based. And uh, yeah, VRTK, Steam VR, if you're using Unreal, this, the VR expansion, um, or you can just, yeah, I would, or use the Oculus ones, I would say. The Oculus ones are the best. Cool. And those Thank are. You. Yeah, and the Oculus website, Oculus for Developers, they have all the SDKs and everything. They're they're really the most advanced right now. So it it, it should be um, portable to um, other headset. Yes, yes, all the Oculus the, uh, open XR. Yeah. Way? Yes, so it will ask you to install Oculus uh, SDK and software and all that stuff, but you should be able to adapt it. Okay, cool. Thank you. All right. Okay. Do you? Okay. Any other questions? Uh, sure, I have a quick question. This is Mike. Yes. Uh, with the next generation of, of headsets quickly approaching, especially with the pass-through and AR aspects, yeah, uh, where do you see Microsoft Mesh fitting into your development lifecycle? And can you even talk about that right now? Uh, Microsoft Mesh is going to be super important, I think, uh, if they do it right. Um, I haven't had the pleasure of uh, joining the beta, even though I've tried to join many yeah. times and we like really needed Arthrex, but um, unfortunately we haven't been able to join the beta. So I don't have a lot of information of it because even though it's supposed to be uh, open for everybody to use, they really have no information whatsoever on it, just that it exists and that it's going to be some really nice BFX videos. Um, by the way, for the people who don't are not familiar with it, I'll show um, a video of what this is, or rather, I'll just mesh Microsoft. So, mesh is going to be a platform uh, for it's hard to explain. Yeah, it's a lot of things, so yeah. it's a lot of things that they're including into one package. Um, but it's also, um, yeah, I guess collaboration is, is really the biggest one. Um, because you'd be able to use Teams and you'd be able to integrate their SDK. They're going to have an SDK for Unity and you'd be able to integrate your SDK uh, with your existing applications and it will just automatically give you um, networked experiences, which is awesome. That's what everybody wants, um, especially in VR where um, having other people, the, the sense of presence is so important. Um, I want to see if I can show a video. Yeah, but yeah, that's that's the main selling point, having other people in there. Um, and so I think it's going to be huge because giving the possibility of being network or having a network uh, system that is freely available for developers 
uh, it's, it's definitely going to bring more developers to using Mesh over other products that don't have the same thing. Now, there's another company that was trying to do the same thing a while ago uh, called Sp uh, spatial, I think. No, was it spatial? Uh, it was called, they have an OS that was called Spatial OS. Um, and they were doing something very similar, but I don't think they were, they, they kind of gave up on VR, AR, even though they had a similar concept. But it's the same thing where you have this multiplayer networking uh, world that is mostly built for games, but not necessarily just for games. Um, and you just drop this SDK into your application and immediately you have networking capabilities by doing a, just a, a few little tasks to integrate everything. Um, so I think that's the big selling point that they're doing. They're trying to give these tools to everybody to use. And that's definitely gonna make a huge difference in the industry. Anything, anything else related to that? Was that, was that does that answer the question? Uh, yes, thank you. All right, awesome. Let's see if I can open it. Oh yeah, I can see the chat now. Guys, don't have any questions. I'm gonna thank the speaker, and uh, we'll see you next time. And May, May fifth, we'll open your mind. Mm -hmm. I hope to see you guys. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.